On August 6th of 2003, a man came home to find his girlfriend, Jean, deceased on the kitchen floor, and both of her children were nowhere to be found. Whatever had happened to Jean was certainly not an accident, and it only took a few hours before the police uncovered everything. This is the twisted case of Nicole Kaczynskis. Hello, friend, and welcome to High Time Crime. My name's Joel, and on here I specialize in true crime and also gardening. I tend to my tulips near daily. But today, we're going over the case of Nicole Kaczynskis, a daughter with an evil boyfriend that were willing to do anything to be together, even if that meant murder. For our story, we're heading to Nashua, New Hampshire. With a population of around 91,000 people, it's nicknamed Gate City for being a travel gateway. Named after the Nashua River, it was originally named Dunstable and was settled in about 1656, but it wasn't long before it became the city it's known as today. If you're in the area, here's a couple of things to partake in. You could visit the Mine Falls Park, which is a 300-acre-plus urban park. It offers a chance to see the nature that's right next to the Nashua River. If you're up for it, you could head on down to Sky Venture and go indoor skydiving, surfing, boogie boarding, or rock climbing. Might have to go there myself. If this isn't your description of fun, you could take a trip to the Nashua National Fish Hatchery, which is one of the oldest national fish hatcheries that's still in operation today. It was established in 1898. Here you can see fish hatch, the beauty of life. But unfortunately, I'm not a trip advisor, and that's not why you're here, or the reason as to why we're in Nashua today. Jean Domenico was born on August 29th of 1959 in Malden, Massachusetts to Charles and Helen Domenico. While her early life isn't really known about, we do know a lot about the person that she was. Jean had a smile that was contagious and infectious, and everyone that knew her was very fond of her. She graduated from Braintree High School and then attended Curry College in Milton, Massachusetts. Her first husband was a man named Anthony Kaczynskis, and together they'd have two children, Charlie and Nicole. The couple got divorced in 1999, and Anthony wasn't exactly a great father. We'll get into the children in a little bit, but for now, we're going to talk about Jean. For starters, she had two part-time jobs, and she worked at a company called Oxford Health Plans. It was here that she worked on group contracts for the benefits, brokers, and administration departments. It was also here in 2000 that she met her fiance, Chris McGowan. It was Chris's first day on the job, and the both of them had been assigned to the same department and just so happened to start training on the same day. That's the way that fate works. But Chris basically fell in love with her the day that they met. He could sense that she was a hard worker and was taken in by her eyes and face, which he said was just so darn lovable. Eventually, the two of them would go on to get engaged, but they never set a wedding date. Jean did wear her engagement ring, but they wanted to wait until Charlie and Nicole were both graduated from high school and well-established in the direction of their lives. The kids came first, and it was important to Jean that they set goals for themselves and focused on realizing their full potential. Jean was considered to be someone who didn't draw much attention to herself and was much more concerned about the happiness of others. At this point in time, Jean and Chris's relationship was basically perfect. They didn't live with each other, but were pretty much inseparable. They rarely got into arguments, they got along very well, and Chris said that Jean was the love of his life. One interesting detail, a sad, somewhat ironic detail is Jean's fear of knives. She hated knives to the point where she was against having them in her house. This included any kind, even down to a butter knife. Chris didn't know about this until May of 2000 during a nice spring night. On this night, Chris and Jean were hanging out in Jean's backyard and Chris was cooking steaks on the grill. After he finished cooking, he walked into the kitchen and 
started looking around for a knife. He then yelled, where's all your knives, Jeannie? As Jean was walking into the home, she looked at Chris and then down at the floor. She said, I hate knives. Chris was really confused and said, what do you mean? Why? A theory as to why Jean was worried about having knives in her house was because she was worried about her son, Charlie. She didn't like Charlie having access to knives or anything of that sort. He had a temper and it's thought that Jean didn't want to keep knives in his reach because she was fearful that he would have the urge to grab one in the case that he got very angry. Now, Chris and Jean would go on to buy a set of knives one day while they were out shopping. Jean didn't really want to buy them, but Chris wanted to, and so she agreed. Originally, they kept the knives in Jean's bedroom and only took them out when they needed to, but Chris eventually convinced her to leave them in the kitchen. Jean's fear of knives and what happens to her later is just a very bizarre coincidence. So on to our next part of the story, which is introducing the children, Charlie and Nicole. Jean was a phenomenal mother who did everything she could to ensure that both of them had great lives. She coached Drew's baseball team and was a part of the parent-teacher organization at his school. It was very important for Jean to make sure the kids were prepared for the day before she left the house. This included food, rides over to their friends' houses, soccer and baseball practices, and anything they really needed. The kids, however, didn't really care and didn't do much around the house. Chris and Jean had to really push them to do simple things. Laundry, dishes, cleaning, and cooking. Charlie and Nicole were not consistent on doing things. Charlie was 14 years old in 2003, and he definitely had anger problems. While very little is known about him, he does say something a bit later that's an interesting detail. As Drew got a bit older, he started hanging with bad people and spent as much time away from home as he could. Also, Drew isn't our primary focus, and he also wasn't the child that Jean needed to worry about. Nicole Kaczynskis was the daughter of Jean, and in 2003, she was 16 years old. She was never really a part of any cliques or groups. She kind of stuck to herself. She went to Nashua High School South, and around the age of 13, she really started to express feelings of wanting some sort of romance in her life, but couldn't build up the courage to talk to any guys. She was very shy, not incredibly outgoing, and easily influenced. Nicole liked using her computer to go onto internet chat rooms to talk to other teenagers. It was here that she met her boyfriend, Billy. On May 10th of 2002, Billy sent Nicole a random instant message that said, Can you help me get some information on an ex-girlfriend? Nicole waited for a moment and then replied, Sure. This little exchange would be the catalyst to an awful relationship that was extremely toxic and detrimental. Let's talk about it. From here on out, Billy and Nicole were inseparable. Only a day after they began talking, they exchanged phone numbers. Now, the both of them were talking on the phone for hours a day. On May 14th, only four days after they started talking, Billy and Nicole had a long phone call. Billy said, I love you, Nicole. Nicole was shocked by this and didn't know how to respond and just said, I have to go. She said that this freaked her out, made her feel nervous, and also exposed. Before the two of them hung up, they promised to call each other the following morning before school. Now, who exactly is Billy? William Billy Joseph Sullivan Jr. was born on March 24th of 1985 to Patricia and William Sullivan. He lived in a town called Willimantic, which is located in Connecticut. This town is dubbed Heroin Town and has a very heavily drug-infested population with only 19,000 people. Billy lived in a house with his four younger sisters and his mother, Patricia, or Pat. At the time, he was 18 years old, worked as a cook at McDonald's, and helped take care of his mother and siblings. When Pat was pregnant with Billy, she drank at least a six-pack of beer every day, if not more, and also smoked cigarettes. Because of all of this, Billy was born four weeks premature 
and only weighed 5 pounds and 5 ounces. Immediately, he had trouble breathing and had to spend days in an incubator. Now, Billy's father, just like his son, was an awful person. William Sullivan Sr. and Pat lived in an apartment complex with Billy when he was just a baby. The both of them would get heavily drunk every day, and when William got drunk, he was violent. One night, Pat and William got into a very bad argument. Pat was holding Billy and walked towards the door when William snuck up behind her, hitting both of them. This was the last straw for Pat. She couldn't take it anymore, and so she had him arrested. Pat had to go to the hospital and get 17 stitches, and afterwards took Billy and the rest of the kids and moved away into an apartment owned by William's parents. From here on out, Billy's problems would just continue. He started to suffer from severe nightmares and was constantly waking up screaming, not being able to breathe. Billy then developed a severe allergy to milk products and he wasn't eating the way that he should. By the time that he was two and a half years old, he developed asthma and had already been to the emergency room five to six times. Only a few days after Pat and the children moved away from the apartment, William called and asked how everything was going. I'm not sure why he wasn't in jail or what happened with that, but the two of them reconciled and William moved in. For the next two years, as Billy went from two to four, more problems started to arise. He started to become scared of loud noises, he was very hyperactive, and things just appeared to be getting worse. Pat and William were evicted by William's parents after a problem arose between them. They were forced to move into a rundown motel located in Groton, Connecticut. One day, there was a fire at a nearby motel, and William took Billy to go see it. Billy was four years old at the time, and he was really scared because he didn't know if any of his friends were in the fire. After this, Pat said that Billy was having even more trouble sleeping, constant nightmares, and even thoughts of death. Obviously, there's no reason that a four-year-old should be thinking these things. A few months after this, Billy took a pair of scissors and cut all of his sister's hair off, and one time, he took a tube of toothpaste and covered his other sister with it. Pat decided to put Billy into therapy, and it appeared to work for a bit. Billy started to sleep better, he stopped acting out against his sisters, and he appeared to be more calm and social. Due to his recent uptick in behavior, Pat then took him out of therapy. Two years later, Billy was now six years old, and by this point, he was actually saying that he didn't want to live anymore. By now, Pat decided to finally kick William out of her life for good. Billy really bonded with his father though, and the two of them were very close. So it's not really a surprise how Billy turned out. One day, Pat and Billy were driving across a bridge when Billy pointed down to the water below and said, I'm going to myself over there. Pat said, really? She said that she didn't want to overreact and startle Billy by saying what he said was bad. And so instead, she said, and how are you going to do that, Billy? To which he replied, I'm going to go up on the biggest rock and then jump into the river because I don't know how to swim. Pat then said, is that so? And Billy said, the river will take me away. Pat asked him why he would want to do that, but Billy didn't answer, and this left Pat in a state of confusion. So she immediately took him back to therapy. This same year, Billy started kindergarten, but he couldn't sit still long enough to learn. He also had trouble making friends inside and outside of the school. When Billy became seven years old, he had to repeat kindergarten and was becoming more problematic by the day. He started doing riskier things like jumping off roofs, jumping out of trees, and various random dangerous activities all while suffering from severe asthma. When Billy was eight years old, his grandmother died, and then a neighbor of his that he played kickball with and was also friends with died after a truck sitting on a car lift fell onto him. At the time of his friend dying, Billy was hospitalized at a nearby psychiatric hospital, and Pat figured she'd tell him while he was there. When Billy heard the news, he said, 
I will see him and hear him and talk to him again. While he was in the hospital, he called his house several times and began acting out, getting crazier. The hospital had to restrain him multiple times and put him into a rubber room. After 30 days, Billy was released and he appeared to be more calm. He was also put on an insane amount of medicine, including Zoloft, Lithium, and Ritalin. In the spring of 1994, Billy was about nine years old and Pat had respite workers or a health caregiver come to her house and help to take care of the children. Billy went after one of them with a baseball bat and threatened to swing. After he waved the bat near one of the workers' heads, he then charged at one of his sister's bikes and destroyed it. Billy was then sent to a psychiatric hospital for another 30 days, and by the time he got out, he continued the same behavior. Pat then tried to put him into another psychiatric hospital, and this one also failed. When Billy got out of the new one, he started to hit his little sisters and run away. In 1996, he was now 11 years old and in and out of psychiatric hospitals due to behavioral issues, and in school, he was a nuisance. Billy was cursing and threatening his teachers, getting in fights with other students, throwing things at people, and he even got expelled. Any little thing at this point would set him off. He was a ticking time bomb. People became afraid of him. Pat still had no idea what to do, and so she petitioned to the state of Connecticut to get a probation officer for Billy. This worked, and so now he had to meet with an officer two times a month and discuss his behavior. After this, Billy calmed down a bit at school, but at home, he was still a problem. In March of 1998, by the time Billy was about 13 years old, something very alarming happened. While he was sitting in class, he looked out the window and saw a truck drive by the school. Billy knew that his father was a truck driver, and this truck just so happened to resemble the one that his father drove. Billy believed that William had wanted to see him, but wasn't allowed to. After staring out the window and noticing the truck drive by, Billy got up out of his desk and ran outside and began chasing after the truck, yelling, Dad! Dad! The school officials were called, and so they went after Billy, and by the time they caught up to him, he started to act insane. He was kicking, and screaming, and just going crazy. The school then called a local psychiatric hospital, and Billy was admitted. The hospital felt that Billy was so out of control that the nurse gave him a shot of Haldol. This drug is often used to treat schizophrenia in children that suffer from hallucinations, psychotic thinking, outbursts of aggression, and so on. Billy was in and out of psychiatric hospitals, he got arrested twice for fighting, and he even stayed for a year at one of the hospitals. For the next five years, until he was 18, Billy was out of control and there was no stopping him. So by the time Billy and Nicole had started talking online, the presence of each other filled a void. For Billy, it was the absence of his father, and for Nicole, well, it was a similar thing, and also the fact that she felt like her home life was awful when it wasn't. Nicole kept a diary and wrote down that she needed to get out of the house and that there were dreams she needed to fulfill. After meeting Billy, her journal entries took a darker turn, and it's very clear her mind state became increasingly toxic. She began to write about how her life served no purpose, and she was wondering why she was even born at all, but then Billy came into her life. Nicole looked at Billy as some sort of savior to her, as if he was this perfect person. Billy looked at Nicole in a very similar light, or so it appeared. Nicole wrote in her diary that God had brought the two of them together because he knew that they needed each other. Right. But Billy and Nicole lived about 108 miles away from each other and were constantly writing letters back and forth and talking on the phone every day and exchanging explicit photos. They were infatuated with each other and said I love you, despite the fact that they never even met. By July of 2002, their relationship had been about three months old and they were scheduling a day to finally meet each other in person. Billy had a week off in August and the two of them planned to hang out. 
Nicole had just turned 15 on June 6th of this year, and by this point, she resented her mother greatly. She was now referring to her home as the gates of hell, and Jean was now Satan to her. Nicole wrote in her diary that she wanted Jean to just go away so that she could get away. Jean learned about Nicole's relationship with Billy and didn't approve of it one bit. The plan that Billy and Nicole came up with was for Jean to drive Nicole to Willimantic, Connecticut, and then drop her off for the weekend. Nicole came to Jean about her plan, and Jean said, no way, not in this lifetime. When Nicole told Billy that Jean had said no, he became furious. He couldn't believe that Jean thought that he was a bad guy. Billy felt like Jean was questioning his intentions and he hated the thought that she felt like he had ulterior motives. On July 21st of 2002, Billy and Nicole spoke on the phone and talked about what Jean said, and Billy overheard Jean in the background say, oh, come on, Nicole, he's a guy and you're a girl. We know what he's up to. After this, Billy became more enraged, and it really drove him crazy. He wrote a letter to Jean claiming that he was not like other guys and that he stayed away from the wrong crowd of kids, that he wasn't into sex, drugs, or violence. Billy said that those words were used to describe his father and he wanted to be nothing like that and that he just wanted to spend some alone time with Nicole, perhaps walking places. After Jean read this letter, she laughed. She was pretty adamant on the fact of Nicole not seeing Billy, but after this incident, Nicole became very depressed. Jean picked up on this, and because she was a great mother and wanted to see her child happy, she caved in. She decided that she was going to finally allow Nicole to see Billy. The only thing was that Jean was going to be there the entire time. Jean had thought that maybe if Nicole had met Billy in person, she would see who he really was and not like him. So on August 20th of 2002, Jean drove Nicole to Willimantic, Connecticut, and within a few hours, they arrived at a local McDonald's. Nicole walked into the store and saw Billy for the first time as he worked in the back. Billy introduced her to a few co-workers, and when he got off, Jean drove them to Billy's high school and middle school, and then to a movie. Jean never left Nicole's side, and afterwards, they dropped Billy off at his house and met his mother, Patricia, and his siblings. This meeting didn't make Nicole want to stop talking to Billy. If anything, it put fuel on an already burning fire and made it explode. Now a little bit after meeting, Billy wrote a letter to Nicole and told her that he had some terrible news and did something awful. He cheated on her in the letter, and he begged her for her forgiveness, claiming that he doesn't deserve her, that he was manipulated into doing it, and that he's stupid, immature, pathetic, and that he's sorry. Throughout the next year and their 15-month-long relationship, Billy cheated on Nicole multiple times, and he always somehow made it out to be her fault. He had another girlfriend on the side in Connecticut, but that didn't stop him. Billy would constantly claim in letters and on the phone that he needed Nicole around to talk to, and if she wasn't, he had to go find something else. But for some reason, the bond between them just grew stronger and stronger. Billy had made Nicole feel like everything he did was because of her, and she believed it. They started to meet each other more and more, and had even started being able to spend some weekends together. Nicole's mother, Jean, became somewhat okay with her daughter's relationship. This was to try to show her that long distance was hard and maybe help persuade her that it won't work. Nicole, however, was very hard-headed and did not appreciate her mother. She wanted to move in with Billy, and so the two of them decided to hatch multiple plans. In the spring of 2003, Billy and Nicole had came up with every possible solution to try and be together. Both of them had written multiple letters to Jean to try and persuade her to change her mind. Billy wrote about how he had dreams of being with Nicole living happily together, and he even asked Jean if Nicole could spend the summer down there. He capitalized the word please, and he thought that this time together could help them cope with having to live so far from each other. 
Billy wrote that Nicole would never be depressed when she's with him, and he told Jean to call him if she had any questions or wanted to discuss anything. Jean thought Billy was out of his mind and told Nicole that there is no way, not a chance, and to get it out of her mind. To just wait until she's 18, and then she can do whatever she wants. But for now, Nicole was Jean's baby. We're now in the summer of 2003, and Nicole is 16 years old. At this point, she hated her mother and looked at her as selfish. She felt isolated inside of her home, and she basically worshipped the ground that Billy walked on. Everything was about Billy. When she went to school, what she wrote on her walls, in her diaries, Billy was always involved. Billy was now 18 years old and still a menace. He was very controlling and manipulative. Nicole barely ever hung out with people because Billy would always think that she was out with some guy doing things with him. Nicole also argued with her little brother every day because she wouldn't get off the phone with Billy. Billy would tell her things about how awful her family was and how they didn't want to see her happy. His mother, Pat, had just helped co-sign a car for him, so it was going to be easier for Billy and Nicole to see each other. It was apparently Nicole's dream for Billy to just show up unexpected, and that's what happened. Originally, this weekend, the couple had planned to meet like they normally would, but Billy had different plans. On August 1st of 2003, he decided to drive his new black Chevy to Nicole's house without saying anything. The night before, however, he did mention that he just bought a black car. So when Billy pulled into the driveway, Nicole saw and immediately knew who it was. She started screaming Billy's name and jumping up and down in excitement until she ran out the door and jumped into his arms. Billy was now going to spend the entire week with Nicole, and things are about to get very heinous. On August 2nd, Billy and Nicole had to help Jean's friend Amanda move into her new home. Amanda was excited about meeting Billy because of how much Nicole talked about him. On August 3rd, it was a Sunday, and Jean, Chris, Charlie, Nicole, and Billy were all getting ready for dinner. Jean had the dinner table set nicely and had prepared a bunch of food. Billy said out loud, Boy, it's been a while since I've had a complete meal, as he smiled and patted his hands on his stomach. Jean replied back, Really? To which Billy took offense. He said that the tone in Jean's voice appeared to be condescending and rude to Billy, that he felt like she was insulting the way that he grew up and his mother, Pat. Nobody else heard it this way, but Billy did, and he didn't like it one bit. The expression on Billy's face was scary. He was furious. Billy then replied back, Yeah, I generally eat at McDonald's because I'm there so much and the hours I put in. He tried to make it so that Jean knew that his mother was a good mother. These remarks really did something to Billy and his thought process of Jean. Later in the night, Billy said to Nicole, she was sounding like she was God. It just irritated me. She thought she was like the best thing in the world, and she's not. Billy thought that Jean was making fun of his mother, and she wanted to replace her because she was better. This obviously wasn't the case. Billy was just insane. On Monday, August 4th, Billy and Nicole started to become a bit upset because they only had a few days left to spend together. They were devastated and didn't really know what to do. But on Tuesday, August 5th, this day really changed everything. The couple began coming up with any type of plan that they could that would allow them to be together. At this point, they began thinking that because Jean had gotten to know Billy a little bit more, after this visit, she wouldn't really like him. Billy and Nicole were thinking that the end of their relationship was inevitable if they didn't act quickly. Nicole suggested that they could run away, but Billy said that the cops would find them. Nicole then said that Billy could live with her and her family, but Billy said that his family needs him. Then the both of them started to joke about murder. The only thing was, it ended up not being a joke. A bit later into the day, Tuesday, and what initially started off as a series of jokes became a series of murder attempts. 
While sitting in Billy's car in the parking lot of a bank, Billy and Nicole began to talk about using violence to get what they want, referring to what they were doing as a dry run. First, they attempted to poison Jean's coffee and put bleach in her creamer. Jean threw it out because it tasted awful. Next, they tried to light Jean's bed on fire, but the mattress wasn't flammable and it wouldn't burn. Lastly, they tried to put a rope soaked in gasoline into the oil tank and blow the house up, but Chris walked outside and they got scared. Billy was fed up and decided that it was time to get physical. He said that he'll confront Jean and just hit her with a bat. Billy and Nicole laughed about this and how they'd do it, what they'd do, and where they'd be. They thought that scaring Jean might change her mind, that this was the only way out. That Jean would think that where she was living wasn't a safe place to raise a family. Obviously, this was some terrible thinking, but they went through with this plan and much more. On August 6th of 2003, it was an extremely hot day in the city of Nashua, New Hampshire. Billy and Nicole woke up around 11 a.m. and no one else was home. Billy had been sleeping on the couch the past few days with Nicole sleeping on the ground right next to him. First, they did the dirty and then held each other on the couch and started talking. They said how what they were doing was really going to work and it was the perfect idea. That life would be better, that they'd be together. Next, at around 4.40 p.m., they decided to go to a bowling alley to create an alibi. When the couple pulled into the bowling alley at around 4.45 p.m., Billy said that he wishes something would just happen to Jean, so that way Nicole would have no choice but to come to Connecticut and live with him. Inside of the bowling alley, they had pool tables, and you had to sign a sheet to get the balls. It has the time of when you sign it, and so they did that to make it look like they were there when they weren't. Billy and Nicole stayed at the bowling alley for about 30 minutes, and then they left to go to Dunkin' Donuts. Here, they sat in the parking lot planning what they were about to do. Billy said that he'll go into the house, approach Jean with a bat, and then make it look like a robbery. He'd go into Charlie's room and first grab the bat that was located behind the door. The couple left Dunkin' Donuts and then drove to Nicole's house to see if Jean's car was outside, and it was. Jean was inside with pizza, waiting for everybody to show up. When Billy and Nicole saw her car, Billy made a U-turn and then drove into the 7-Eleven parking lot located one block away from the house. Where they were parked was a perfect place to do what they were about to do. Billy suggested that they go into the store, and when they were about to go inside, a police officer pulled into the parking lot. They then walked into the store, got what they needed, and then got into line. While they were standing in line, Nicole became paranoid because of the officer. When the couple got back to the car, Nicole said that somebody knows something and was convinced that their plan had been soiled and that the police officer was following them, waiting on them to act. Billy said that he doesn't know that maybe that is the case, and so Nicole told him to just drive. Billy then started driving, headed towards Jean's house, but the police officer started driving right behind him. Billy looked into his rearview mirror and said, Oh, sh**. To which Nicole replied, What? Billy said, Don't look back. Don't f turn around. That cop is following me. He's following us. He knows something. He's on to us. Nicole said to pull into Brewster's, an ice cream shop, and to see if he follows them into the parking lot. Billy then took a right into Brewster's, and the police officer just continued driving straight. Their hearts were racing, and Billy said, that was close. Nicole replied, I know, maybe we should forget it. Unfortunately, Billy was set on doing this. By about 6 p.m., the couple pulled into the parking lot of the 7-Eleven for the second time. Billy told Nicole to go into the store and wander around to look at things, but he'd be back in about two minutes. Nicole was hesitant and said, Okay, Billy, but I don't know. I don't know if I want this. She thought that seeing the police officer was a sign that they shouldn't go through with it. But Billy didn't care, and so he got out of the car and started walking towards Jean's house 
and things were about to go down. Nicole didn't try to stop him, didn't say anything, and Billy did not try to stop himself. Inside of her home, Jean was just chilling and relaxing, sitting at her dining room table in the kitchen. The same 7-Eleven that Billy and Nicole had been at, Jean just bought a cheese pizza here for them, Chris, and Charlie. All of a sudden, the front door flung open and Billy walked inside. Jean looked up and made eye contact, but then went back to what she was doing and Billy closed the door. He walked a bit closer to her and said, Hi, Jean. He couldn't think of anything else to say, and Jean said, Billy? She was surprised to see him without Nicole. Billy then walked to Charlie's room without saying anything and grabbed the baseball bat that was behind the door. He then walked back to the kitchen where Jean was standing. She turned around and looked at him as he stood next to her, holding a bat. Billy said, I hate the Yankees. To which Jean replied, can you believe the Braves lost? Billy said, no, I can't believe it. He then placed the bat next to an entertainment system in the living room. Billy thought to himself that he doesn't have the guts for this, and he thought that he knew himself. He then said, Kobe won't get a fair trial, huh? This was because during the time, Kobe had allegations against him. Jean replied back, no way, all that media attention, he will go to jail. They kept talking and made their way into the living room. Billy picked up the bat and started swinging it around and said, Love those socks, referencing the Boston Red Sox. Gene said, Put that down. You're making me nervous. Billy said, I used to play baseball, Gene. You know that? He then sat down on the couch next to Gene and began to shake, thinking that he didn't have the guts for what he was about to do. Gene replied, Well, you have the body for it. You're built like a ball player that's for sure. Soon, Billy used his phone to call Nicole in the car. Nicole asked, what's going on? To which Billy replied, she's getting nervous. Nicole said, you're not going to do it, are you? Billy said that he has to go. He said, bye, Nicole, and just hung up. Jean overheard them talking and said, is that Nicole, Billy? You tell her to get her home. Billy disregarded her comment and continued to try to make small talk about baseball. Jean said, what's going on here, Billy? Nicole then called Billy and told him that there was a cop at the bank getting money out of the ATM, but Billy's demeanor had changed. He seemed like an entirely different person at this point. Jean then started screaming at Billy and said, why isn't Nicole with you? Where is she? Billy said, she's across the street. To which Jean said, why? You tell her to get home. She needs to eat with us. It was at this moment, Billy thought to himself, a mother shouldn't be yelling at their daughter like this. She's just sitting somewhere, not bothering anyone. This particular comment made Billy so angry and immediately started an argument between him and Jean. It was now time to either walk away or act, and he chose to act. Billy then replied to Jean's question by yelling, she's picking something up at the store. I came here to get my inhaler. By now, Jean was furious, walking back and forth from the kitchen, arguing with Billy. Everything that Jean was doing was bothering him so bad that he couldn't even hear what she was saying. He saw her lips moving, but couldn't understand a single word, that it was just a blur of words all aimed at him. With Jean's back turned to Billy, she said, Nicole needs to get her home. And a few moments later, Billy struck her with the bat. He was aiming for her head and ended up missing and striking her in the back. This pushed Jean against the wall and absolutely shocked her. She didn't fall or anything, and she turned to Billy holding her side and said, what the f are you doing? Billy then swung the bat again, this time hitting her in the head. Once again, Jean didn't go down, and so Billy attacked her. They fell on a coffee table in the living room and destroyed it. An intense wrestling match began, and Jean was way stronger than Billy had anticipated. Jean tried to escape through the front door, but Billy pulled her back in and pushed her down to the floor. She tried getting up, and he pushed her down again. Jean then sat on the floor for a moment to catch her breath, and then she got up and tackled Billy. He managed to get away, and figured since he already started this, 
there was no turning back. He broke free from Gene and then ran into the kitchen and grabbed a knife. Billy then stabbed Gene in the shoulder with so much force that the blade broke off. It slashed his hand and fell to the floor. Billy then ran and grabbed a second knife from the set of knives that Gene was so cautious about not wanting around. He stabbed Gene a few more times, and while he was telling this story, he laughed about it. But during the fight, the knife dropped to the floor and Gene managed to pick it up. She ran at Billy and was going to defend herself when she slipped on her own blood, bumped into Billy, and then went headfirst into a door knocking the window out. After this, Billy grabbed another knife and then viciously took Jean's life. Her last words were, Okay, I'm done. So, so sad. But Billy then went to leave when he noticed that he had blood all over him. He ran upstairs, grabbed the first jacket he saw, went back downstairs, stripped down to his underwear, and put all of the clothes inside of the jacket and folded it. Then he went and cleaned off in the bathroom. After, Billy got dressed and went over to 7-Eleven to meet Nicole. Afterwards, it was a discussion about how Nicole couldn't believe that he actually did it. And then she went inside of the house to go grab something and saw what he did. Eventually, they left and tried to use their awful alibi as an escape out of this. Obviously, that didn't happen. But regardless, they were excited because in their minds, they could finally be together. They were finally going to have their dreams come true. For some reason, they thought that they'd get away with this. How dumb. But Jean was found by her fiancé, Chris, and here's what happened. So Chris had come home and noticed that Jean's dog was still outside, and no lights were on inside of the house. He thought immediately that this was weird and something was off. As Chris walked inside, he yelled out to Jean with no response. Eventually, he walked a little further and saw Jean's leg and then her whole body. She was on the floor, face down. In a panic, he ran over to her and began calling out her name, and she wasn't responding, so he began shaking her. Chris assumed she fell and hit her head or passed out, because over the past few days, she was complaining about not feeling herself. But as he was looking at her, he noticed a large pool of blood underneath of her head and then noticed blood splatter everywhere. Chris called 911 in utter disbelief. When the officers arrived, they found Jean deceased and an investigation began right away. Initially, they suspected Chris of being involved, but after realizing that both of the children were gone, they kind of knew what happened. Now, Chris, however, initially thought that Charlie was responsible for this because of his anger, but when he talked to him, Charlie said that he knows for a fact that it was Billy. It has to be. Chris thought that there was no possible way that it could have been Billy, as the Billy him and Gene met appeared to be a nice guy and friendly. But sometimes in life, things don't always appear as they seem. By the next day, both Billy and Nicole were being questioned by the police and spilled the beans right away. They both had separate stories and immediately went against each other. Hours before, they were so in love and willing to do anything to be together. And afterwards, they want pretty much nothing to do with each other. It makes no sense at all. On September 9th of 2005, Nicole Kaczynskis was sentenced to serve at least 35 years in prison, while Billy Sullivan Jr. was sentenced to life in prison on July 15th of 2005. He tried to plead insanity, but that didn't work. He was also talking to another girl while he was in prison, who was only 15. Billy wrote her over 100 letters while he was in prison. He told her that he would marry her if she convinced Nicole to testify that someone else had killed Jean. What a pair of awful people. They do something absolutely terrible and immediately go against each other. It's so weird to me how they were willing to commit such a heinous act, but then act like they didn't care about each other. But they're both rotting away now, and Nicole did deserve life in prison. While 35 years is a decent chunk of change, she knew what was happening and could have easily prevented it. Jean Domenico was a bright light in a dark world. 
She really did a lot for her community, and people still remember her to this day. There's even a Facebook page dedicated to her that was made in 2014 called Random Acts of Kindness on behalf of Jean M. Domenico. Jean was very loved and is incredibly missed by those that were closest to her. It's awful knowing that she had a huge fear of knives and that ended up being the way that she died. It's almost like she knew something, like she had a certain instinct telling her to stay away. Regardless, I hope that she's resting peacefully. But anyways, thank you for watching this episode of High Time Crime. If true crime is your thing, then please subscribe and hit the like button because that's all we do. I also have a second account with my brother named Horrifying where we tell stories about everything paranormal. This includes true crime, mysteries, and things that are just downright spooky. I'd greatly appreciate if you subscribe to that too. I hope you have a great rest of your day. Take care, friend.